let's talk about UNET. I know that some of you know about it already, but you are using it in a different context. You are not using it for image segmentation. And actually, UNET was introduced to do image segmentation. What's going to happen is you start with an image, and then you are careful with your strides. And uh, whenever you see an arrow that is blue, that's going to be a three by three convolution. So you do one three by three convolution, another one. Then you do a max pulling with a stride of two, and that's going to give you less resolution. So now the resolution is this vertical size. Then you do a bunch of other convolutions, uh, max pulling with a stride of two, a bunch of other striding, a bunch of other convolutions striding. So now you know what is inside that object. That's the what of the problem. The rest of it, you have to up sample. This is just the convolution. You do up convolution, another up convolution, a bunch of other convolutions, etc. But then we saw this idea in the previous paper as well. We need to keep the local information. But the difference is that you take the local information from your input and copy and paste it. And this is just a copy and paste operation. And you just concatenate channel wise. And this goes back to the previous question. So you just concatenate channel wise. And this is going to copy the local information. And you do that for different, uh, at different resolutions. For instance, for 290, you just copy and paste, you copy and paste, you copy and paste, and then the rest of it is straightforward. And that's why it has the name of a U net because it's U shaped. So is the picture clear? So we saw the same idea in the previous paper as well because we want to keep the locality. So now let's go into the math because I promised you to give you the exact formula for the convolution. Now we are going to see it here, but let's start with the convolution and write it down. I expand it in terms of its uh, terms. You want to know the value of the output of a three by three convolution at pixel location X, Y, and the channel location L. So that's what you want to know. No, you take A, that's the input. It's gonna depend on X, Y, and some channels. So for X, you go one, lay, one step to the left, one pixel to the left, one pixel to the right, and one pixel up, one pixel down, one pixel to the left up corner, one pixel to the right up corner, etc. And that's how this summation is being formed. So that's going to take a small three by three window of your input, and then it's going to sum over them after multiplying by matrix, after multiplying by a scalar, and then you're going to have uh, L different filters, and K is just going to be your inner product. That's why you have this summation. So that's a three by three convolution expanded out. What is a two by two max pooling if you expand it out? Because the stride is two, you're going to put a two here because you're going to jump uh, every two pixels. So that's why you have a two here. And then the rest of it, you are taking a window of size two by two. And that's why you have a zero index and a one index here. And you find a maximum. If you want to do average pooling, you're going to find a mean here. That's your max pooling with a stride of two. That's how you reduce the resolution. And what is up convolution now? You're just reusing your weights. And that's why it's called fractionally strided convolutions. So let's see. We know that our stride is going to be two because we want to up sample. And we want to know the value at this location, 2x plus 0 or 1. So you want to know your value. What you have is you have only one pixel, and then you want to get two pixels out of it. So what you're going to do is you're going to use your weights. Actually, you reuse it. You start with one pixel, and that one pixel is going to output two pixels for you, actually four pixels for you. So there is only a single pixel here at the input layer. The summation over k is nothing complicated. You are just doing the inner product. And then you're reusing the same weights on the same input pixel to give you the output. So is this clear? And as you can see, it's going to have the same. This W is going to be the same as the original W. That's actually the backpropagation algorithm through these two channels. If you had a convolution that had a stride of two, then uh, this two by two on up com is just the inverse of a three by three convolution with a stride of two. So you need to ask me a question if 
something is unclear. So the main mechanism of getting two pixels out is because you're doing it, or for four pixels, you're doing it for multiple values of your weights and then keeping the pixel value the same, right? Exactly. So you have the same pixel, you have four different Ws, you multiply the same pixel by four different values and then that's gonna give you four different pixels at the output. Cool. And just make sure K is the channel, right? Yes, so K is a channel and L is also your channel. So channel-wise, things are not complicated. It's just a matrix vector multiplication. But pixel-wise, you have four weights that are being multiplied by the same pixel. Cool, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So I promise I'm gonna give you the exact formula for a two by two of convolution and that's it. That's a deconvolution. So once you see the map, you see that these are not complicated stuff. But when you try to visualize it, it's gonna be more complicated to visualize. And we saw the same thing, deconvolution, when we wanted to do visualization of the features in our neural networks. That was a couple of sessions ago. So that's the operation. And this is exactly what you're gonna see what is coded if you use TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, under the hood, that's what's happening, okay? So I owed you two things. One was, what is a deconvolution? Then I owed you one other thing, and that's the loss function. What is the loss function for image segmentation? This is your loss function. Forget about W for now, so let's set that to be one. You want to increase the probability of that pixel being correctly labeled. So this is the ground truth label, and you want to increase this probability, or equivalently, you want to increase the log of that probability, or you want to decrease the negative sign of that log of the probability. So you have a pixel, that pixel has a couple of options. It could be belonging to a cat or a dog or a, an airplane or the background. What you're gonna do is you're gonna increase the probability of this pixel belonging to the ground truth, which in your, in your case might be a cat. So you want to increase the probability of that pixel being a cat. And what is this? Uh, let me just bring up what L is. So L is the true label for each pixel. And how do you get your probabilities? You're gonna do a softmax and it's gonna be pixel wise. So that's your softmax and this is the output of your network. And why do you need a W here? You don't. In general, you don't need it. For image segmentation, we can set that to be one. But because our application area is a biomedical, these boundaries really matter between your cell. So you want to really focus on the boundary and identify where your boundaries are. And the other problem was that there is imbalance in your classes. You have more data of a particular class compared to the other. That's why you're gonna introduce this W. The first term is gonna take care of the imbalances in your classes. So that's gonna be your class frequencies. And when you have training data, you have these statistics. You can simply compute them. We can know what is the class frequencies. So that's not tough, that part we know. And these are two numbers that they chose for W0 and sigma squared in terms of pixel. And D1 and D2 are the distance to the border of the nearest cell. If the distance is really far, you don't want to give much weight to the probabilities and that exponential term in collaboration with this negative sign and the square term is gonna do that for us. If D is big, the exponential of negative of a big number squared is gonna be small. And uh, you're gonna have the other term is the distance to the border of the second nearest cell. And whenever you're doing training, you know these statistics because you know the ground truth. The other thing that uh, they do in the paper is rather than zero padding, on your original image, you're gonna do a reflection padding. So whatever that you have here is the mirror image of it that you copy and paste to give you the correct resolution. And the rest of it are just results. This is the ground truth. That's the original image. Somebody gave us the labels with a biomedical PhD was doing the labeling for us. And uh, this is the output of the algorithm. Ground truth, I mean, background versus not background. And uh, this W, the plot here is exactly W. So you're giving more emphasis to the boundaries. That's why you're introducing this weight function. Let's see some other results. This is some other cell from another data set. The yellow line that you see is somebody doing the labeling for us. And the prediction of the model is here, the green one, similarly here. And in terms of numbers, 
unit is doing very good compared to the previous state of the art. But there is also something very essential when you work in fields that lack data, like biomedical, is that you need to do a lot of data augmentation. So without data augmentation, they couldn't write this paper. They do shift and rotations, and they also have some methods to make sure that their algorithm is robust to deformation and gray value variation. So these are all data augmentation techniques. Any questions? I have uh, one question, mm -hmm. um, which may have to do with uh, what you talked about uh, with this like mirrored padding. Um, but their final output map is a lower resolution than their input image. Um, and I guess I thought the goal was to like produce something of the exact same resolution. Exactly. So this is gonna be the exact same resolution. That's the input, that's the output. That's where the, that's the area of the image. Okay. And you want to get the same image here, but then uh, on the boundaries, you're gonna run into trouble because the field of view of these parts is bigger than. Mm. And that's where they've just mirrored it and flipped it. Yes. Okay, okay, I see. And they're doing mirroring and flipping because of their application. They knew something about their application domain. And so zero padding wouldn't work in that mm. case. Okay. Would that work? The one thing also that's <clears throat> that's key is it's, it's tiled. So I think you run it four times on like the input image and then combine the output because each one is like a subset of your image that you run it on. Oh yes, that's another thing. Uh, you don't take the entire image and input it. You take small tiles of it. Yeah, thank you, sir. And then you'll combine those like segmentation maps at the end, sort of. That's because these pixels are sort of independent. Actually, the algorithm is treating them as independent because of the summation here. And yeah, exactly. I think you, you do just add at the end to get your segmentation maps uh, in the like overlapping regions. Exactly. Like a, yeah. Thank you. Any other? I had a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. I was going to ask about the, the distance functions because I've used unit before and, and ended up using doing like a using a hyperparameter for the weights that I kind of just picked. Um, so I was just curious if you go a little bit more in depth into these distances and you're taking per pixel the distance to the next nearest cell. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. And so you end up, but you end up getting like zero for the interior. It looks like from that map. It's going to be very close to zero. Not exactly zero, but it's going to be very close. So what you're doing is taking a pixel and measuring its distance to the boundary. And the boundary is the next pixel. And that's going to be D1. And D2 is going to be the distance of this pixel and not this cell, but the cell next to it. That's D2. And uh, the idea is that near the boundaries, you care a lot about your probabilities being correct. So you give them more weight. So that's the idea. Uh, yeah. Another interpretation I had was because there's way less boundary pixels, uh, you don't want your network to like forget them, right? Also, it's the same thing. Yes. And then these, uh, sorry, the, the nearest cell is of the same class or does it matter the class of, like if you had two like yellow cells next to each other, do you treat um, them as different cells or the same one? No, they don't have to be the same. It's just to the next. And it says here to the nearest cell or to the second nearest cell. The type doesn't matter. Any other questions? So is everything clear? Okay, perfect. Yeah, three more minutes. We can start the next topic.